Well, good morning, church. It's uh, good to be with you here on our Wednesday devotional. And I decided this week, you know, we're, we're in, Jason started the Y series last Sunday. And usually we have, well, I don't know, seven or eight weeks where we get to answer these questions and uh, all your Y questions that you ask. And this year, because of our schedule and everything's kind of compacted, uh, we haven't had as many weeks to do that. So I thought, well, I'll take the next two weeks and I will answer two of our questions. Uh, so the question this week uh, is a great question. It's really actually kind of two questions that were pretty similar. So the question is, I've always wondered why did God send Christ to hell? Uh, the, the, the second question, which is just like it, and it's one that I'm asked all the time uh, because we use the words of the Apostles' Creed sometimes, and in it it says, you know, uh, that Christ descended into uh, to hell, and people are very uncomfortable with that. Why, why did God send Jesus to hell? And those are two great questions, I think, because they can be asked from both sides of the biblical spectrum. Uh, if you are uh, have no biblical knowledge or background, uh, and you're maybe you're new to faith or whatever, and you say, "Well, you know, I don't understand. If God is so good, why would He send His Son, whom He loves?" To hell, that makes no sense. Is that in the Bible? And if you are well-versed in the Bible and you kind of know it pretty well, then you know that, I mean, nowhere in Scripture does it say those actual words that God sent his son to hell. And so uh, you might know it's kind of comes from this one, or people think it comes from this one reference in 1 Peter chapter 3. And so that's really kind of all we have. So it's a great question. Um, so first... I would say uh, that this is actually one of the most important theological questions that you can ask. And I think the, the answer is so important for us as believers. So I'm going to read you that text that uh, many people think that this comes from. And it comes out of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 through 20. And it says, For Christ died for our sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but he was made alive by the Spirit. And, and here's where it gets kind of important, or at least this is what people look to. Uh, he was made alive by the Spirit, through whom he also went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. And that's it. That's all it says. Um, so you can ask the question, well, okay, well, how do we get that Jesus went to hell. So here's my answer. And let me say uh, up front that I, I completely agree a thousand percent with the statement in the Apostles' Creed that Christ descended into hell. Uh, but it may not be exactly as we kind of think about it. Because when you think about hell, uh, you know, 99.9% .9 of us think of uh, probably like a, this deep, dark cave and fire and demons and devils holding pitchforks. And they're guarding the gate so that no one can, can ever get out. Uh, and, you know, I mean, we don't really see that in Scripture, obviously. So what, what is hell like? I, I mean, I always tend to kind of lean towards Pastor Tim Keller's view of uh, someone asked him one time. And y'all have heard me say this before, but uh, a skeptic asked him one time, you know, you don't really believe you know, in hell and this fire and brimstone and all that stuff. And you know, Pastor Tim said, no, no, no I, don't, I don't I don't really believe in that. And they said, aha, I knew it. I knew that was fake. He said, oh, no, no, no. I, I, I believe it's infinitely worse. Infinitely worse. Uh, just fire and brimstone and all those things. You know, that's just the best language that either the, the writer, the prophets or the writers of Scripture or, or those of us who have kind of put these things together afterwards that's the best language we have to describe something that is so infinitely worse. On the flip side, you know, heaven is so much infinitely greater than we can imagine. All the words that we could use to define it, crystal lakes, seas of, you know, uh, of, of streets of gold, all that stuff. It's, it just pales in comparison to the reality that will be heaven. And also, uh, we could say that that is hell. But here's what I can say about hell definitively. Here's what I do know. Hell is the absence of God. Uh, if being in the presence of God is what we were created for, all right, and being there is the most joyful, most worshipful, most amazing, incredible thing ever, 
then we have to assume we can draw a straight line to the conclusion that hell uh, would be the absence of all of that, the absence of the presence of God, the absence of the light of God, the absence of the love of God. And so it would be infinitely worse than anything that we could possibly imagine. So hell is simply the absence of the presence of God. So did Jesus go to hell? Well, absolutely. And here's what I mean. In order for you and I to be saved, okay, in order for us to be saved, Jesus had to take upon himself the full weight of our sins, all right? He had to assume every single bit of our unrighteousness in order to impart to us his righteousness. There could be nothing left, right? There could be no sin, nothing left. Uh, he had to present us perfect to his Father in heaven. And so the only way to do that is to atone for it, right? And so Jesus takes on every bit of the weight of all of our sin. He takes it on to himself. And because of that, in that moment when he takes on the weight of all the sin of the world, and on the cross is where that happened, uh, he took on the weight of all the sin of the world, it is in that moment that he can no longer be in the presence of God. He cannot be in the presence of his Father because God cannot look upon sin. He can't do it. And so for you and I to be worthy, to be accepted into heaven, we have to be completely washed, washed uh, of, of all our sin. And we have those, that moment on the cross. And so, uh, you know, we, we can talk about the first Peter verse. People always say, like, what is, what's going on in that first Peter verse when he went and he preached to those in the prison? Well, you know, scholars are divided all over the board in terms of what that really means. Some say, well, he uh, was going down there to uh, give them one more chance, to preach to them and give them one more chance to be saved. Uh, and then others say, well, no, Jesus... Uh, kind of this this victorious Jesus goes down to hell and he kind of stands with his hands on his hips and says, see, uh, I told you, I told you this is what was going to happen and now I've defeated death and I'm moving on. Calvin seems to kind of uh, put us squarely in the middle as all good reformers uh, and says that's not really the case for either. But but what I think, what, what, what happens, Matthew chapter 27, Jesus is on the cross and he says those horrible words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in that moment, that is the moment where Jesus feels the full weight of all of our sins. Every bit of it he brings to bear on himself. And it is in that moment that the Father turns away from his Son. It is in that moment that Jesus literally experiences hell not the fire and the devils and all that stuff. He experiences the lack of the presence of his Father for the first time in all of eternity. And so we say, well, did he descend into hell? You know, I think that language is there. It, it, it's helpful, right, in terms of uh, kind of giving us the dichotomy between, well, he ascended into heaven, and so, you know, we can say he descended into hell and he ascended into to heaven, but he descended into the depths of all that humanity and sin could muster. He descended into the depths of the humility of all of our sin. And he held that there. He held that there from the moment of his, of that moment on the cross when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All the way until he had finally atoned for those sins throughout that, that awful Holy Saturday and into the Resurrection Sunday when he is in the presence of his God, resurrected body and soul, and he comes before his Father. And all of this was done so that you and I can stand with confidence before the Father, knowing that Christ has borne all the weight of our sin, that he literally went to hell. He left the presence of his Father for the first time in his life and for the last time in his life. And he bore the weight of our sin and he beat back death so that you and I might have an eternity with our Father in heaven. What good news we have. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we give you thanks. God, we thank you for the gift and the mercy of Christ on the cross. And we thank you for his willingness 
to bear the weight of all of our sin so that we might know what it means to stand in the presence of God. And so, Lord, we can with confidence proclaim that we have been saved, we have been set free, uh, and when we repent of our sin, when we confess our sin, we can know that it has been carried to the depths of hell so that we might one day experience the joy of heaven. We pray all this in the powerful name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Church, I hope you have a great week, and I hope you'll keep asking good questions so that we can keep, uh, keep doing this.